Good morning, Washington, D.C. Welcome everybody in the D.C. metro area this morning to D.C. Retail Summit 2020, Our Recovery. We're actually going to speak about recovery methodology as we come toward, hopefully, the end of this pandemic. A couple of house rules. And first, I want to say thank you to our host, Mayor Bowser, John Falchicchio from the District of Columbia, DEMPED, Think Local First in the Washington, D.C. Economic Partnership. First of all, this presentation is being recorded. The session will be posted online in one to two weeks. Please use the Q&A to enter questions for the presenters, and we'll try to get as many as we can after the discussion. Use the chat to introduce yourself and network with fellow attendees. Please keep your remarks respectful to the panelists and your fellow attendees, and particularly me, your moderator for today. There are um, ASL interpretation. Please look uh, in the chat for a link if you need that. And if at any time you need assistance, you can direct a message to our Zoom manager, Allie Greenberg, in the chat. Following this session, you'll have the opportunity to listen to the Paycheck Protection Program hosted by Harold Pettigrew of WACIF. It's going to be a wonderful event. And then uh, uh, you'll also have the tenant and landlord relationships uh, as well. Uh, my name is Eddie Tuvin. I'm with FSC First. We're a certified development corporation and we provide small business lending. What have I been doing since March? I haven't even seen my office. We are going to go to the first slide. I have uh, been involved in uh, a, a grant reward program. We received uh, 916 applications, 596 were approved. $20,190,500 was awarded to small businesses. So my perspective is a little different than most lenders. As the chief lending officer, we underwrote all these transactions, and I've actually seen quarterly financials from every one of these businesses who were required to provide it, and the trends did not look good. Today, we're going to discuss with panelists a number of things, especially retail trends. So I'll go to the next slide, Allie. Restaurants and retails continue to struggle. The numbers are not good. The uh, ABC News reported, next slide, the review cites 60% of restaurants that temporarily closed are never going to reopen. That's a problem for us because we've all recognized now that all these small businesses are suddenly important to the whole total global economy. Large businesses are suddenly asking, what is this SBA? What is PPP? How do we pivot, et cetera? So with that, let me introduce my panelists this morning. I'm very, very fortunate to have Lauren McDaniel, Vice President of Programs at SeedSpot, where I have to admit I'm a business mentor for transparency. Xavier Epps, a financial expert and CEO of XNE Financial Advising, LLC. My dear friend and co-worker in the past and partner in crime, fighting for small business success in Washington, D.C., Oswaldo Acosta. He is the uh, current uh, president and executive director of City First Enterprises, which as many of you know, is affiliated with City First Bank that just had an amazing merger, a very important lending institution that reaches out to minorities and small businesses across DC. And uh, Michael Schumann, the director of local uh, economies programs at Neighborhood Associates, an economist, an author, attorney, entrepreneur. He's gonna to talk to us about uh, what he sees is his perspective from a, a lending point of view. With that, I'd like to roll into our panel discussion. Remember, please use the chat. Please ask us questions. Uh, we're here for you today to help us move forward. So I think the first thing I'd like to ask is what type of funding should entrepreneurs and small business owners be focused on at this time? And when you talk, let us know a little bit about the types of businesses, the stage of business, the revenue sizes. What do you work with as you answer this question? And uh, I'm gonna say ladies first, please, Lauren. 
Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Lauren McDaniel, VP of Programs at SeedSpot. SeedSpot is a business incubator and accelerator. And what that means is individuals who have an idea for a business or who have an idea for ways that they want to transform their business, maybe launch a new product, a new service, uh, try a new business model out, or even target a new customer. Um, sometimes it's hard to navigate that space on your own. And so uh, SeedSpot supports DC-based and actually uh, globally-based entrepreneurs to really take the first steps uh, in getting that business started. We've traditionally worked more with those idea stage for the first time entrepreneurs, but let me tell you that over the past six months, we've had a lot of uh, small business owners, uh, retail uh, leaders, owners um, come to us and say, hey, I've got to try something new uh, because my market has dramatically shifted. And so all of a sudden, individuals who really had a lot of uh, kind of inertia in what they were doing are now finding themselves back in that entrepreneurial space. Um, and so, you know, there are several different uh, opportunities for finding funds. And I know those of you out there probably have tried tried a lot of them. Uh, so there's debt finan financing opportunities. Um, you know, there, there are some relief opportunities, um, equity financing where you're giving away a percentage of your business. Um, there's even looking at, you know, cutting, cutting your costs. Um, and I'm sure that a lot of you are, are working through that and have worked through that. What we have found um, supporting thousands of entrepreneurs over the past eight years is no matter what the climate is, Revenue really is the type of, of funding that you are going to be able to have the most control over. And I know it's hard to hear that right now because revenue is a, a struggle. Um, and the way that during economic shifts, during market shifts like this, we look at revenue is really redefining where that revenue is coming from and, and talking about that P word pivot. Um, and so, again, that's looking at new ways that you're going to charge, new customers you're going to charge, utilizing the assets that you already have and thinking about selling those differently. And that's a lot of the work that we do um, at SeedSpot. But my biggest piece of advice would be to make a list of everything you have, expertise, relationships, it, uh, inventory, space. You've been using it in a certain way up until this point in time, but can you leverage that space differently? Can you leverage the expertise differently? If you have delivery vehicles, um, can you leverage those vehicles differently um, in a way that meets a need that someone would pay for right now? And those types of entrepreneurial uh, thoughts are really what's going to start to open up uh, new revenue sources for you. Oswaldo, what do you think? Um, I, I, I absolutely agree with what Lauren says. Uh, so one one uh, caller or one uh, 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 dimension I would add to that is that uh, uh, my advice to entrepreneurs that come to us and ask for uh, additional capital uh, through debt is that we, this sounds counterintuitive, but we advise them to be very conservative or very cautious in um, acquiring new debt. Uh, these are unprecedented, unpredictable, very uncertain times, uh, and are also the, they are also desperate times. And people, one, are willing to do whatever it takes to get another one hundred and fifty, two hundred thousand dollars, because the nature of entrepreneurs is optimism. Uh, the reality is it's increasingly hard, and we don't want, and we don't encourage entrepreneurs, small business owners to get yet another liability because they think at the end of the day, it will be okay. Well, it might not be okay. Uh, so my advice is twofold. One, think very hard about that $150,000 you may be getting at Square or Lending Club or any local uh, CDFI lender. Uh, you will be... Um, uh, that that debt will be in your balance sheet in your personal financial statement in three four years from now. So 
think creatively, try to bridge this reality to the post-COVID world with the least possible debt. Uh, try, try to uh, slim the operation, if you will, as, as Lauren said, uh, pivot in any way you can. But I would say avoid that that is not strictly necessary to relaunch the operation that you have. Do not, do not expand just because you think that's that's the best idea you had now. Uh, that's my advice. Uh, one, one trend I am seeing, uh, and, and I think it's very worrying, very worrying, is that small business owners, particularly those with less than $300,000, $400,000 in revenue in Main Street, they are getting as much as the uh, credit card debt as possible. Uh, banks, because that's the nature of the business model, are unforgiving. Uh, we don't want to see, and we will see, of course, these amounts of debt in, in low-income households and, and small business entrepreneurs once all of this is over. And of course, uh, this is America. This is a capitalist system. Uh, banks will want the money back. And if you cannot pay the money back, you will go, you will have to do things that people do when you don't cannot pay you, your, your obligations. So it will, I think what we're predicting is this will have a, predict, a, a regressive impact in the small business owners. And we want to mitigate that via advice. So that would be, uh, I hate to be sound anticlimactic. Uh, I, I'm not the, 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 the cautious or the conservative person often in the room, but I, I need to caution entrepreneurs, walk slowly, this is gonna end. We just need a bridge and just hold tight. And at the end of the day, when this calamity is over, your business could and will reinvent itself. Uh, I'm actually so hopeful. I'm hopeful that Secretary Mnuchin will eventually come to a point where whatever PPP or idle funding that wasn't given in forgiveness will be forgiven because that's the way we'll remove some of this debt that's over the heads of these small businesses. Um, Michael, I'm going to leave you to last because of your position as a capital provider, and I'm going to ask Xavier to weigh in here. All right. Thank you so much, Eddie. And um, again, everyone, uh, Mayor uh, and the whole team, I think local, I'm very gracious for this opportunity to be one of the panelists. Uh, when entrepreneurs are looking at acquiring more capital, acquiring um, you know, any type of form of debt, I think right now is is even more crucial to look at the type of funding that doesn't come with the repayment such as grants uh so many public companies so many organizations nowadays for the like going back to april and may have you know put out different type of small business initiatives uh initiatives for minority uh own own businesses and i think a lot of retailers have a lot of opportunities to you know acquire capital that doesn't require repayment. Um, just recently, uh, Lowe's and American Express teamed up about a week or so ago to offer $10 million in, in, in grants uh, for entrepreneurs and small businesses. So, you know, the businesses right now are cash strapped. So you, you wanna try not to put yourself in a, a predicament of like you were, like um, what someone was saying, adding more debt um, to the balance sheet and putting yourself in a, a bad financial situation once you know COVID-19 is uh, behind us. So I think it's super important that you look into the grants and, and the free cash that is out there for businesses. Michael, where do they find this? Well, uh, I wish I was a capital provider, but at last I am just a capital <laughs> advice provider. And there are two pieces of advice that I'm gonna give uh, in this hour. Uh, one is, yes, to avoid debt, but you can acquire equity in ways that do not in any way interfere with your control of your business through crowdfunding. Um, but second, and this is what I'd like to focus on in answer to Eddie's first question, you can do pre-selling, that is sell your customers on buying six months, a year's worth of goods and services, 
Um, and what's nice about pre-selling is that it's not a security uh, for the most part, and uh, there's no legal hassles around it. And I'll give you an example of it. Um, when the pandemic hit, I got very worried about the restaurants and retailers uh, that I love. And I went to one who all of you know, Andy Shalal at Busboys and Poets. And I said, Andy, um, I estimate that over the next year, uh, I spend $1,000 eating or taking people to eat at Busboys and Poets. I'm going to write you a check for $1,000 today because I want you to hold on to some employees and have better cash flow. And he was so pleased with that, he actually gave me $1,200 worth of gift cards. So I got a 20% rate of return on my investment uh, that I think he's going to be good for. But the point is, is that I can't save Andy on my, on my own. No one customer can do that. And really, I think what you want to do is try to set up some kind of platform where you get lots of your customers as a way of saving you to engage in uh, the pre-paying the pre activity. And there's actually a website out there called local-futures.org that facilitates communities or groups of businesses doing this in a systematic way. And I think this is really the low-hanging fruit for helping restaurants and retailers. Well, that's excellent because that was our fourth question of the day. So I'm gonna ask that question now so that we can continue it uh, with the other panelists, which was talk about the importance of mobilizing DC residents to do pre-purchasing and mass from restaurants and retailers to bring in revenue. And then I'll come back and we'll, we'll recycle back to some of the other questions. So uh, I'm gonna go backwards. So Xavier, what do you think about that in terms of uh, prepay or other models that we can help keep these people alive. Yeah, no, I, I think the prepay, uh, prepayment of um, services um, and and products is, is unique. It's a unique idea. Uh, when you're looking at it from a retail perspective, it is, you know, it is products. And, and there, there has to be a balance between how much I can accept and prepay versus how much can I deliver on as an entrepreneur, as a retailer, um, because it's not like a service where the only thing that you need to do is worry about your time commitment. It's, it includes raw products, raw minerals. Um, it, it, you have to take something that's unfinished and turn it into a finished product. And for retailers, it's all about timing. So when you're looking at how can I take in a prepayment of uh, cash flow or revenue for products that I haven't rendered or, or something that I haven't given in, in the future, uh, it really depends on what space you're in. Uh, I think a lot of a lot of opportunities are there for people in the retail space that uh, provides like the restaurant chains. I think that's a wonderful opportunity to look at prepaid um, services, but I may not necessarily think so for a retailer that sells uh, sells clothing um, because so much more goes into um, purchasing that inventory than it does when you're you know selling hot paninis or something like that. So I, I do like the idea. I think it's uh, it's a way to also engage the community and help um, small businesses like retailers stay alive. Thank you for that. So Oswaldo, from your perspective, does it bother you that the balance sheet may have this prepaid asset on it that they then have to deliver on down the road if there's a big buildup there? Are you concerned that they might not be able to supply that inventory like Xavier's talking about? No, I think it shows resilience and creativity from the from the entrepreneur. And at the end of the day, it is it is a soft liability in the balance sheet from the owner's perspective. Uh, if you're an airline, yes, your miles are a hard liability, and there is a market for that. But if you're a restaurant, uh, following example the example of Michael provided, it is actually great uh, to see this kind of. Uh, ingenious ways to raise funds and that, uh, in the same vein i think it's quite positive when we come uh, and see when we are looking at the balance sheet and someone says i just raised twenty five thousand dollars from my family and friends that shows networks it shows depth and it, or even if it's twenty five hundred dollars uh, at the end of the day you know people with less access to networks raise less money but if you have twenty five hundred dollars from 20 people it's better than twenty five thousand dollars from two people uh, 
it is just my algorithmic mind thinking in those terms. But uh, yeah, I think that's that's quite positive. And the other big endorsement that comes from from the kind of uh, examples that Michael was providing is that it shows a, a, a deep and committed client base. Someone is willing to pay you for a service that you haven't delivered. Not only they believe in your brand, they believe in you, and they think that you have a place in the local community, the local economy. That is what people in corporate America call brand or branding. Uh, and the small businesses have a big equity piece, which is branding. And it's impossible for us as small business advisors and lenders to quantify that. Because we don't know. I mean, we know what the value of, we have a proxy for the value of Google or Nike or, or Verizon, but for a, the value of a brand of a small business community that, that works, that is in Lawrence, neighbor, in Lawrence neighborhood, we don't know. I mean, I, I will have to survey every single neighbor in the community to know, okay, these people have, you know, a presence there. Nike, yes, we grew up with it, Google, whatever. Uh, so in the future, those who understand how to, how to value, how to assess or gauge the, 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 the value of a local brand of a business, my Himalayan restaurant here, I think they, they have their value. It's much more than on the half a million dollars the building is, on, is worth. Uh, but they cannot go to a bank or to a square and say, hey, I, I'm going to collateralize my brand the way that, you know, big organizations do. Um, in the future, uh, fintech, whomever is capable to come up with a proxy through social media, that's the big business idea. Come up with an idea to say, okay, Eddie's restaurant sells half a million dollars a year, but the revenue has this characteristic, it's not Panera revenue, it's, it's committed revenue, it will be multi-generational, blah, blah, blah. That, I would make a check now if I knew the value of that asset. So when Michael comes up with that, with that thought, I was like, oh, okay, I get a sense of who you are now. Um, that's, rather than, than, than business philosophizing now, I'm trying to just give an insight to how you know, we look at the risk from our perspective and to business owners, of course. Keep that in mind because I'm going to come back to everybody about pivot strategies, true impacts of thinking local first, using your wallet to vote every day, and the importance of how interconnected we are and how suddenly during this pandemic, the corporate psychologists who thought that humans couldn't change their behavioral patterns rapidly, suddenly learn that when faced with certain issues, human beings were willing to socially distance, they were willing to wear a mask, they were willing to do a lot of things that they thought they wouldn't do in a very, very short period of time. Lauren, what do you think as we talk about this pre-purchasing en masse from restaurants and retailers to bring in revenue as a as a solution and other concepts you may be giving as, as a, because your organization is a mentoring organization and people within your organization have their own internal board of directors, which some of Oswaldo's customers don't have. Right. So the great thing about working with entrepreneurs is that they are constantly selling things that they don't have right now. Uh, they are, the name of the game is pre-purchasing. Um, so think about someone who just has an idea or is building, building their product, building their app, um, and they need to show partners, they need to show investors, uh, they need to show co-founders who are putting in sweat equity. Hey, people want this. People are signing up. Um, they also need to just bootstrap their cash flow. And so entrepreneurs are constantly selling, uh, pre-selling. Um, so you know, some of the, the techniques that we've found have worked really well is really leveraging three, three like social tools. If you can figure out these three things, it's a human motivator and you will get people to buy. So the first is urgency. So people want to buy now. Have you ever um, been like looking at a flight uh, looking at a restaurant reservation and it says, you know, only two seats left um, on the flight. And you're thinking, oh gosh, I don't know if this is the best price, but ugh, only two seats left. So it's a human 
um, sense of scarcity that when we feel that something's urgent, we want to buy now. So um, this could be, again, going back to the assets that you already have. You have space. Um, that could be turned into event space. You could say, hey, we are doing 50% off um, event space. You know what? That's meeting a need because how many people have delayed uh, graduation parties, weddings, um, retirement parties, et cetera, because they can't get people together. They're, they want to do that event uh, once things open up. So, you know, the urgency, hey, we're giving away three spots of 50% off event space. Here's what that looks like. You already have that asset. Um, we are, you know, we're going to be renting out our rooftop. We're going to do a home catered party. So what do you already have that's not going to cost you a lot of development money and you can make that urgency? Um, again, exclusive. So urgency is the first one. Exclusivity is the second one. So can you say... Um, we're going to do a taste, you know, we're launching a new, a new set of wines um, for the fall. We're going to be sending out bottles um, to, you know, our VIPs to, to let us know which ones should be uh, featured on this year's menu. So how do you get people to feel like they're in a club? Well, in order to get in that club, you need to pre-purchase $500 worth of uh, gift cards that's going to be used within the next year. So that's exclusivity, make people feel like the VIP. And the third one is social proof. So that is kind of um, when people look around and say, oh my gosh, other people are already hopping on this. Um, other people have signed up, you know, here's brands that we're working with. Um, here's a testimonial. Here's a video of someone um, talking about how, you know, they did their wine tasting. And so people don't feel like they're the first ones out there. Um, so I, I would, I would urge you not to just say, hey, here's gift cards, here's like what we normally sell and let's just try to sell more of it. But really think about, can you do these mini campaigns? Can you utilize exclusivity, uh, urgency and social proof to make people feel like they've got to hop on this now, they're getting something special, they're thinking ahead just as much as you are about post pandemic life. Um, and then that's gonna start getting that cash flow in now. And you've already got those assets. You can deliver on those later. That's going to help get the ball rolling when things do open back up again. Great thoughts. You know, one of the things that um, I watched during this pandemic was my friend Wendell Allsbrook opened up his butcher shop in Georgetown at the absolute worst time in history possible. He did a lot of research. He worked at the organic butcher over in McLean. He came down and saw me at the bank and then he opened the doors. So shameless uh, event. There it is. Um, he got on social media and he started a charity project for prosperity. And the next thing you know, Jamie Lee Curtis is talking about him on her Instagram. And now he's so busy, he's expanding. So how important is it to align yourself with some charitable, socially conscious engagement these days as it relates to rebuilding uh, and making sales. Is that critical, Lauren? I do think that, you know, we've seen a trend over the past decade or more toward people wanting to enact social change through uh, the dollars that they spend. And gosh, she couldn't be in a more, uh, you know, active community than DC. Um, so absolutely, I think finding ways to show that you are helping the community is also going to get you some press time. So we've seen entrepreneurs, um, there's a DC based entrepreneur or, or, or venture here called Good Find. Um, they help uh, people in the DC area find food trucks and their social impact really is food trucks are often uh, started by and led by um, immigrant workers um, who are, you know, trying to get a, a footing in the U.S., uh, provide for their family, um, and really kind of start that small business that would hopefully turn into a retail space. Well, food trucks have um, taken a big hit, and also people have, have struggled um, in, in parts of D.C. to actually get food. And so part of what Good Find did was say, hey, let's um, donate, let, we'll pay the food trucks as part of their marketing budget. So we'll pay the food trucks to go out and provide food in these areas. They got a bunch of press for it. They're an app. So how many people downloaded um, Good Find? 
And so I think that's one example of, you know, reporters are looking for positive stories right now. There's so much that's that's bringing us down. Um, so, you know, this could be a great opportunity to get on people's radar, you know, have them hurt you on their Google Maps, have you have them uh, pr put you as a priority, you know, on on open table or whatnot, um, visit your website, etc. get on your email list by aligning yourself with some of these causes that people care about and then getting getting out there um, and aligning yourself with a lot of the positive momentum that we're seeing in the community. Yeah, and the beauty is that after Fox News came and after Channel 7 came, business was so booming that he ended up opening a second shop. And so he's opening up a, a fishmonger's in Georgetown as well. So I'm going to move to the earlier question, which is um, how can a business establish a cash reserve during this time of uncertainty? I always watch Bill Gates. I remember the amount of cash that, that they had. And as of last year, it was 136.6 billion, at which time it was the largest cash reserve. But if you look at second quarter um, 2020, Apple disclosed they had 193.82 billion in cash just sitting there. It's kind of like Warren Buffett on his cash file waiting uh, to trounce. But, you know, these are difficult times. We're talking about cutting back expenses. Cash is king. But how do these people, the question that was raised is, how can a business establish a cash reserve during this time of uncertainty? I'm going to hop to you, Xavier, first, because I think that's more your forte. Yeah, no, thank. this is a, a perfect question. And uh, with a lot of businesses and entrepreneurs and clients that I'll be working with, that I'm working with is, you know, I tell them to look at their, their business cash flow when it comes to saving capital or profits the same way they do their, their personal personal um, lifestyle. Uh, there, there's such a dynamic connection between how consumers treat their personal uh, finances. I try to pull that dynamic and apply it to their, their business model and say, look, you're going through something that's pretty similar to what you would do if it was personally related. So let's treat the business that same way and look for ways to cut back on expenses, especially things that aren't generating any type of returns for your business. That's going to allow you to put away a little bit of that profit every single month um, when 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 the when this able to uh, to, to be done. Um, for some of the small businesses, we we're going through exercises and looking back historically with what the profit and loss has been uh during certain periods where rev when 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 seasonality was an issue and then we say look this is what we did last year when revenues were low and we were able to put away money so what are some things that we can implement or replicate now given COVID, so we can do the uh the same thing it really starts with the entrepreneur and the business owner the retailer knowing their numbers knowing their margins knowing you know when they're doing well and, and the season that they're going to do great and, and apply all that historical knowledge to the, this moment in order to, to save cash flow and put away money for, for a rainy, rainy day. Like even down to marketing and things dealing with hosting sites, if there's any item that a business owner or a retailer can do on their own because they had that freed up time to do it, they definitely need to do it so that they can park away some cash reserves. You know, one of the things that we did when we gave away 21 million, you think it's easy, it was very, very difficult, was we provided a lot of technical assistance. And we, where would you say, we saw a lot of things, people who weren't even in good standing, people who didn't have financials. How do you, how do you like even drive the boat if you've got blinders on and you don't have financials, you don't have a, 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 a current income statement and balance sheet month to month to month to show revenues and expenses, you can't guide that ship. Where's a good place to go for training for somebody who wants to build that next level of, of education about how to be a better manager based on what you just told us? Yeah, uh, so the, the the first place, it really starts with that, that person itself. You need to be able to go and read about uh, practical ways to, to keep books, you know, or simplicity of bookkeeping. Um, you, you can look at services like QuickBooks, or you can look, in, look into just, um, uh, apps out there that will help you with bookkeeping for a minimum fee but you cannot advise a, a entrepreneur or a retailer 
about what they should do financially without a PL, without a balance sheet, without a cash flow statement. And a lot of times these owners and retailers are going out to get PPP loans and SBA loans, and they're putting down numbers that aren't factual because they don't know what their business is really doing. And it's going to, unfortunately, it's going to come back and bite some of them. But um, this is just imperative for the owner to take out time and say, look, no one's going to care about my business like me. So let me take the time to go through my books. Let me take the time to download my bank statements, export this data from the bank account and see what the revenue has been through the different merchants, PayPal, Square, and look at what the, the fees have been, what are my margins. You, it, it really starts with the entrepreneur to take that time and look at the numbers. Yeah. And maybe get yourself over to SCORE and meet with a retired executive who actually understands your business model and can help you, or work with a banker like Oswaldo who gives you know personal advice. So I'm going to move that into asking Michael and Oswaldo first, then I'm going to come to you, Lauren, about what are three ways a business model can reinvent themselves? And I think what we're talking about here is pivot. There's a great article, if anybody hasn't seen it, from July 7th, Harvard Business Review, how businesses have successfully pivoted during the pandemic. It's free. I recommend that everybody who's listening here today go get this article and read it. And it talks about three important steps at the very end of it that are necessary in order to uh, make a pivot, which is, which is fundamental. But Oswaldo, you have a book of business. You've got loans that you're right now servicing. You've got clients you have to talk to. What are you telling them about uh, of, of ways that they can uh, adjust their model now here midship, midstream? You know, they're in. They took off. They're already halfway across the ocean, and now all of a sudden the course has to change. What are you telling? Well, I don't make the the usual mistake of pretending that I know more about the business. That, that they do. Uh, I, I've learned early that, uh, uh, the lesson early in my career as an entrepreneur and then also as a, as a business advice provider. So uh, the only thing that, are we, that we ask our borrowers and potential uh, clients is that they need to be very critical uh, uh, in their thinking about how is the business going to look in six months in a year, in three years. And if they don't have the habit of uh, research uh, through papers like the one you're showing or talking to other business business owners, they have to. They have to start being, uh, it's time to be curious, it's time to be inquisitive, it's time to ask all kind of questions. If you if you have a flower shop and you want to know how is the flower business going to look in three years from now, nobody knows. Those who claim they know, they are lying or they are foolish themselves. But there are clues, there are hints, and they need to start thinking. Okay, so there will be a lot of e-commerce. There will be apps. There will be a consolidation. There will be no flower business because people will think that's a frivolity and I don't want to eat flowers, so let me close my business. So all of those things, um, if, if you own a restaurant, uh, it's, it's a kind of restaurant that you have viable in a world that is paranoid and, and super cautious about contagions. I mean, all of those things, uh, you, need to, you need to start reading. You need to start talking to people that you think know more about the business than you do. When you are a small business entrepreneur, there is one, and I close by the, with this, there is one mistake, and I made as a, as a business owner myself, and I see it all the time, there is this tunnel mentality. You're so busy working 80 hours a week that you have no tolerance to even to talk to, us, to, to friends and family members, you just focus on the business and, and then it gets to a point where you think that you know how it works. You need to break that pattern and just be, just go back as if you were a child, you know nothing about the business and learn about the new environment. That would be my advice um, if I was to provide one to, to a small business owners. Just be, be Jeff Bezos, just, be on day one because this is day one thank you michael what do you think so my favorite example of a business 
small business that creatively diversified is Zingerman's Deli in Ann Arbor. Uh, and after 10 years of operations in the 1980s, they wanted to grow. Uh, and they decided to look systematically at their inputs and their outputs. Uh, and at their inputs, they uh, found a bunch of new businesses. So they serve sandwiches on bread. So they created a bakehouse. They serve coffee. They created a coffee roasting company. Uh, they, ser they serve ice cream and cheese. They created a creamery. And then looking at the other side, they had good food. They created a sit-down restaurant called the Roadhouse. They had good cakes. They created a mail order cake business. They had good customer service. They created a training module for other businesses. So in all today, so we're talking about 40 years later, Zingerman's is 12 independently owned businesses that co-license a brand, collectively employ 750 people, uh, earn $65 million a year. And what I think the lesson from that is, is number one, look at your inputs and see opportunities for growing business on the input side. Second, look at your outputs, see opportunities for new value added products that are appropriate for the moment. So moving from t-shirts to masks in this moment would make sense. And then there's a third one too, which is pretty subtle, but it, Zingerman says to every employee says, you know, if you want to start one of these businesses, we will support you. And so it turns the business into a font of entrepreneurship. It tells employees, you're more important than just delivering your work. You are a part of this business. So those are all ingredients that I think businesses might look at right now. Excellent. So three things from this article. First, a pivot must align the firm with one or more of the long-term trends created or intensified by the pandemic, including remote work that we've all learned actually works, shorter supply chain, social distancing, consumer introspection, and enhanced use of technology. The second, a pivot must be a lateral extension of the firm's existing capabilities, cementing, not undermining, its existing strategic intent. And third, Pivots must offer a sustainable path to profitability, one that preserves and enhances brand value in the minds of consumers. So just two seconds of shameless advertisement. Lauren, are you doing anything at Seed Spot with a pivot camp this week? Thank you so much. Uh, yes, I, I really am moved by this conversation and we've got you know a number of people on the line now who I know are working toward a pivot. Um, and so if you would like some hands-on support, it's perfect timing next Thursday, Friday, Seed Spot is hosting a two day pivot camp. It is four hours um, each day. And um, I would love to give you $25 off of that camp, which is listed at, at $199. Um, so I put that information in the chat. Um, really, my advice would be, I think every, like, the, the article was fantastic. Um, Michael, what you had to say, completely agree. Um, when you can target a, either a, a, a new customer or a more, um, a more targeted customer, when you can think about ways that you want to deliver that, um, ways you want to price that. And that means things like looking at a, a licensing model. Do you have um, a process for doing something? Do you have a, a methodology, uh, a subscription model? Can you charge people month over month? You know, these are, are new ways to think about pricing um, and, and to really unpack new customers. And, and let me share a small story and then we've got a webinar with this entrepreneur. So you can actually see exactly how he did everything. But uh, we have an entrepreneur that we worked with through Pivot Camp just a couple of months ago within uh, two weeks of coming through Pivot Camp, he, he transformed his business. So he was doing workout classes. Um, he was formerly a Zumba instructor, but he had his own business after that where he was doing workout classes. Um, had quite a, a large clientele in Phoenix, Arizona, and just everything was in person, dropped off completely. Um, so 
two things he did within that time. One, he really went introspective as an entrepreneur and said, what change do I want to make? Um, he has a family member who is um, who spends their life in a wheelchair um, and has struggled with health. And so he decided my passion is going to be enabling people who are uh, living in, wheel, you know, working in wheelchairs, spending their lives in wheelchairs to be able to have a healthy lifestyle and be empowered. Anybody should be able to be healthy. And so he stopped trying to target everybody. And he said, we're going to target people. He calls it um, workout on wheels, wonders on wheels. Um, and so he does wheelchair workouts exclusively. He went from in-person to online. He, t he rented out the apartment next to him like that next day, I think. He made a stu he painted it green, made a green stream studio out of it um, and started filming workouts on wheelchairs, putting them on YouTube, putting them online. Now, if you go and look at his early stuff, it's like it's, you know, he's fumbling around with the camera. Um, he doesn't have the right audio equipment. He doesn't have the right camera equipment. But as he started to grow, people were following him. Like he was exponentially growing that list on a daily basis. Um, and so I think one, dive into your passion to make a move, like rent that apartment, uh, paint that wall green. And then three, don't be afraid to launch right now. It's not gonna look pretty, it's not gonna be perfect, uh, but you've gotta put experiments out there to see what's working. Now he his goal is to be the number one wheelchair workout uh, service in the world. And so think about, you know, just a few months ago, he was on a very different trajectory. He used this as an opportunity. And I think everybody on this call has the potential to find that niche, um, get the support they need, launch that pivot within two weeks. And if you would like the opportunity to do that, we would love to work with you um, and, and really support that effort. And you just led into the next question, but what you also highlighted there was this behavioral change of how suddenly we've recognized how important we are to each other in our local ecosystem, our little economy here in metropolitan Washington, DC, and now how important everything that Raj and the team at Think Local First have been preaching about, think about where you're buying your supplies, think about how you're putting money back into our own community, as opposed to sending your money to you know, are, are you working with a bank like City First or are you depositing your money with a bank that's out of San Francisco or Charlotte? And why is it more important to be working with a local bank where the money goes right back into the city and helps us continue to grow? And also all the concepts associated with what's happening now with uh, the B movement, certified B Corp movement, which has to do with keeping people and the planet in the same line as you think about profits and as you make these managerial decisions, thinking about that and keeping that to, to direct your mission. And then finally, as, as I end with that, that you need to make sure that you vote with your wallet, that every day you pull your money out, you have a choice of who and where you spend it and that we need to help each other. So I think you already started, Lauren, with the question, what steps can retailers take now to understand their resources and needs and lessen the impact on the ecosystem? So now I'm going to move to Oswaldo to talk about that question and then let Michael and Xavier talk about it as well. Yeah, that, that is an interesting proposition. How do you make sure that you are, you, you're business is compelling enough so people can choose you as opposed to going to the corporate brand uh, in the suburbs or just across the street. Uh, uh, I think that the short answer is we are rational individuals and we need to deliver quality and, and customer service. Uh, if we cannot compete on price, we can compete on, on, on community and, and, and branding and and personification of the way, the way we deliver on our products. I think uh, there has to be a much, marketing, it cannot only be Facebook and, and Twitter and, and Instagram. It has to be a personal touch in everything the small business do. And I would, I would argue that the idea that we, the individuals shop with their wallet and they want to help their small businesses 
has a lot of limitations. The people do it. Uh, we do it at home. I, my friends do it. Uh, but we have the ability to pay a little bit of a premium because we're privileged. But if you are uh, struggling and you don't have the ability to say, okay, I'm going to pay $12 as opposed to 10 so I can shop locally, uh, it's, you know, there, there is not a viable local economy that way. So uh, no business has survived by support from the community only. It, there is also the component that small businesses has and must understand that survival requires being as good as their corporate partner. And they could be. Uh, we cannot compete on price. They can, we cannot compete on, on many things that the corporations do. Amazon or the Amazonification of the, the local economy is it's going to reinvent. I don't think the small businesses will perish. I think the economy, the small business economy will be as strong as it is now in 50 years from now, by the way. Uh, I think we're just seeing a trend. Uh, the, the Uber and the app economy and all of those things are, is an episode. Uh, but uh, uh, yes, that's my only advice. So social capital, it's important. But it's, I think, at the end of the day, we, we as a small business, and we are at the same thing, uh, Eddie and all the service providers here. With this, I conclude, we're also competing with the behemoths of the business. Sure. As lenders, uh, if you are a small micro lenders, if you're LDC, Wake Up, or any other, we're competing with, with the fintech companies that have a lot of money. How do we compete with them? Well, you know, we have conference, uh, conversations like this, and we have a network. But we also have to deliver capital that is well priced, technical advice that is worth it, and and the continuation of our engagements in the in the local corridors. That's and that's big, advice I take for myself. And there's a big difference between short term relationships and something much more long term. You know what happens when you go to that fintech provider that provides this, but what about all the other things that you have available for them as they mature? And they move from City First Enterprises, say, to the bank, a City First Bank that has so many products and services and people you can come to and talk to and things like that. It's, it's a big difference. We're going to have a poll in a second, folks. Please keep your eyes out. We're going to ask you what type of financial support that you received. Um, and please answer that question. It'll only take a second. And as we go through that, it reminded me that, you know, you need to think about um, changing systems. You need to you need to bring on technology. There's a lot of large companies that have been using just-in-time inventory for a long time. Maybe that's something you have to use in order to reduce your overall expenses and increase your turn of your inventory as well. I'm going to flip, Xavier, Michael, I'm going to ask you, um, are, are planning, creativity, and investing new practices required for financial resilience and to reduce harm? Uh, that's a that's that's a great question. And just to the piggyback off of the um the ecosystem question, um, because what I'm seeing with clients that are retailers is that we're we I'm telling them that they have to be forward thinking. Uh we're in a space right now where social distancing is a must when you go out. And if you're if you know that your business is going to be impacted by that, we're going, we're in the fall getting into the winter. And, you know, retail sales are particularly higher, you know, this season. So knowing that, that that's going to be the case, what are you doing to position your business that social distancing doesn't impact your, your, your sales from a perspective of, well, you can't have a bunch of people outside in the line when it's cold out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So you have to now take this time right now and forward think what November and December is going to look like for that brick and mortar store that you have knowing that you know to have six feet of separation in the cold consumers aren't going to be out there doing that I don't care what you're selling so you need to be very forward thinking and how that impacts the you know the community and and your business um, but now to uh, to kind of go into the, the question at hand you you really need to to, to take a step back again and, and say to yourself, what am I doing currently with my business that I can change to be in a better position in the future? And that could be with COVID being around, without COVID being around, adaption is key. And I think Lauren made mention to it when she said that there was the individual, the entrepreneur that was a Zoom 
uh, a Zumba instructor. He went from being inside to saying, hey, well, I'm going to do everything inside my home. A lot of fitness instructors went from having a physical space to work in, and if they want to be innovative, can say, look, I'm going to do uh, fitness instruction from my home with a big Zoom. Like, it'd be a whole Zoom of, instructor, uh, of instructors sitting there to say, look, we're going to put everything together, and I'm still going to be successful. I'm going to reach out to my existing clientele and say, yeah, the building may be closed, but I can still provide that service for you. So innovation and adaption and being able to pivot is very, uh, is, is very, is, is the key in order to be successful. Thank you. Ali, I lost the poll results, but I saw it came up. It looked like PPP was the largest. So 61% of our audience received Paycheck Protection Program, 39% DC Small Business Recovery micro grants, one of which was managed by City First. Um, no one received an East of the River Small Business Economic Relief micro grant that's here. So I'm sorry that the folks from Ward 7 and 8 are not here. Uh, that's where Andy Shalal actually opened his last bus boys and poets and he did it specifically to bring a sit-down restaurant to that neighborhood cost him a lot of money in training there weren't a lot of people there that had the expertise and the experience but he stuck it out i've spoken to him numerous times about it the economic injury disaster loans from the sba the idle loan 30 percent of the folks here no one did crowdfunding no one had an sba loan it's hard for me to believe that no one had either a 7a loan or a 504 loan or a community advantage loan those are very low down payments. The banks are incented to make those loans by guarantees or a percentage being from a first lender uh, so that they would do a loan uh, that they wouldn't otherwise do if it wasn't for that. Only 3% uh, said they had a bank loan, which really doesn't surprise me because most of the banks that I know shut down for the most part during this period because they just didn't know what was going to happen. They, they never saw it. It was unprecedented times for them. 21% took personal money or, or barred from friends and family and no one from private investors. Um, we're going to move into questions, but I want to give uh, that are on our chat, but I want to give Michael a, a shot at uh, responding to that last question that Xavier just talked about, about planning creativity and investing new practices required for financial resilience and to reduce harm. Well, I think what the way I, I am going to pivot uh, on the question and uh, focus on that little uh, result in the survey that no one yet has tried crowdfunding. Uh, and I think that one of the ways that you can think about the future of finance is by taking crowdfunding seriously. And I'm not talking about donation crowdfunding. I'm talking about investment crowdfunding, people putting money in as equity, royalty, or debt agreements. Um, believe it or not, nationally crowdfunding was legalized in 2016 and half a million people have done it in the four years since um, 1500 companies have raised 350 million dollars 60 percent of the crowdfunding issues have been successful the average crowdfunding raise is 270 thousand dollars the most successful entrepreneurs for crowdfunding have been women and people of color precisely those markets that the conventional funders have overlooked. So here's the thing. When you go for advice about where you get funding, if you're going beyond credit cards, friends, and family, usually you'll be told, oh, go to angels, go to venture capitalists, go to banks. Now, if there were 100 Oswaldos around, I would say banks might be viable, but frankly, Go to your audience, go to the people who love you, because you're simultaneously going to raise capital and raise the most incredible marketing force possible, the people who love you. And one of the reasons to just circle back to the first question, that pre-purchasing is so powerful, this will identify who are the likely people to invest in you. Excellent. Thank you very much. I think we're going to move to some of the questions here right now. Um, Karen Baker, I have a question from Indra Klein. Hi, Indra. I didn't know you were here. Are there any efforts by local retailers in making videos that can be pushed out via website uh, that would highlight 
uh, local uh, businesses. And um, I want to talk about the Builders Dinner because uh, Think Local First does exactly that by uh, focusing on the Builders Dinner. The next one is going to be May 6, 2020. But if you look at the Think Local First website, you'll see some of the amazing organizations that um, we've recognized for these kind of efforts in the past. And again, that's a, a great place to start. Um, Holly Simmons, regarding a business's cash reserves, what are some low hanging fruits or ways to make that money work for you rather than having it sit in a checking account? Oh. Well, rates are really low right now. Yeah, I was going to say, I was going to, um, you know, before before the pandemic, I would um, always advise um, businesses to look at high yield savings accounts. Um, you know, American Express, um, Live Oak Bank is for businesses, even business, they had business corporate accounts that had, had high yield savings close to 1%. Uh, but now, you know, with the pandemic, you're looking at, you know, <laughs> three quarters of a percent. Uh, of yields uh, right now, which is still greater than the, the checking of uh, one tenth of a percent uh, that you would get for that capital, just that cash to just be sitting there. So you have to, you know, to have your savings, but you want to, as a business, you want to be liquid with your cash. You don't want to tie it up in a CD um, and you definitely don't want to put it in any um, risky trending investments in the stock market, you know, i.e. Your, your five for one splits with Tesla or your four for one splits with Apple just because it looks good. Uh, because this is business capital that you're going to need to survive. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Thank you. That's great advice. Um, ten second response from each one of you, please. Number one best recommendation you would make to any entrepreneur to survive and conquer economic COVID-19 impacts. Lauren? I would say keep that attitude and spirit up. Um, the, the mentions of the, the entrepreneurs that I talked about, they were committed to success and willing to be agile and willing to um, adjust no matter what that looked like to be successful. Um, and that really has been what I've seen uh, is, is fall in love with the problem that you're solving, fall in love with the people that you're solving it for, don't fall in love with the solution and just keep that attitude and that positive energy up you're going to find a way through. That was 12 seconds. Sorry. I told you 10. <laughs> Oz? Um, think of your business in the way it would look like in 2025. It feels now that this is, this is the new world, but this is not a new world. This is an episode. Uh, it will come to an end and there will be a need for your service when social distancing is, is a thing of the past. Uh, and you need to start thinking, how are you going to be in business in the very long term? If you have yeah. the ability to do so, if you can survive this episode, you will be in much better shape. That's my, my advice. Think so people long term. People need think time. They have to use the three Ps, prior, proper planning. So they have to step back from it and think about it and get it in paper. This is my plan going forward. Michael, what are your thoughts? Think about ways of moving your expenses as close to zero as possible. If you have to move into your house uh, as a way of doing your business, if you have to offer your employees stock instead of pay, if you have to offer your vendors long-term agreements, get those expenses down. And as Waldo said, avoid debt like the plague. Xavier? Um, I, will, I will say you, you got to create your own pipeline. L look historically, even the sales are low right now. Look historically at your demographics in terms of your customer base and do something different. Reach out. Don't just send emails. Reach out. You have the contact information. You know, create a list. Reach out. Ask them if there's anything that you could be doing with your business, your service that can improve, or, or ask them if there's anyone that may be interested in that service. Just don't wait for the clients to come to you. You go to them. Excellent. Thank you. Marie Williams asks, do mergers of small businesses play a possible role in pivoting? Well, where should we start? Let's start with Lauren, because many of her companies are dealing with things that most of us don't know about. 
Series A and B and C fundraising and merging and so on and so forth. They're thinking about exit strategies. And she talks in her world more about burn rates, whereas Oswaldo talks more about debt service coverage ratios. What do you think about that question about mergers of small business playing a possible role in pivoting? I think absolutely. I mean, it's always important to have an exit strategy in mind. Um, there are lots of smart people who are looking at the market shifts as opportunities to rethink the way that we shop, the way that we um, think about brands, um, what a brand will provide. And so I think um, my recommendation there would be to network, um, build your advisory boards, uh, build your connections. You know, you can start with just LinkedIn. You can start with summits like this. Um, you know, connect with each of the people on this panel and just start building that network. Uh, but I think, you know, absolutely there, there are people that are looking for opportunity. And if they see your venture as an opportunity or your business as an opportunity, um, I think it's absolutely worth pursuing. Who else wants to weigh in on that? My Two out of three mergers we know empirically are failures. Uh, the companies are worse off than where they started. So I would say date before you marry, have a partnership before you merge. Quick, we're getting some great questions right now. Does anyone have any advice specifically for e-commerce businesses selling on Amazon? Q4 is the busiest season and buying inventory to resell is really a major challenge. Any feedback? Plus they're pretty expensive. There are many vendors out there that provide advice, but I think um, and can give you white label solutions for your operations in Amazon. But I, from experience, I can tell you that I can share that all of that knowledge is accessible. But it's a platform that is designed for for the masses, and you should be able to, if you have the time and resources, you should be able to figure it out in house. Um, just to spend the night uh, uh, clicking on Amazon, asking questions. They have a good Q&A platform in the, in the website. And there is nothing better in business than knowing how it works, because that's how you lead. You don't have to do it yourself, but you have to know how it works. So if you outsource that very core piece of your e-commerce, then you feel like there is a piece of your business which potentially can save you that you have no idea how it works. It's a black box. And so my advice is if you have the aptitude uh, to learn IT basic uh, e-commerce, just just go to bed at 3 a.m. for a week, uh, clicking on Amazon, uh, and you will learn how it works, and then do it yourself first. That's Excellent. my advice. We have the two-minute deadline. Earl Cohn, I'm going to answer you directly. SBA loans cannot be for investment. It can only be for owner-operated businesses, and owner-occupied real estate. That being said, there are numerous SBA designated lenders throughout the city. City First Bank is one of them, industrial bank and so forth, local community banks. Look for CDFIs. I highly recommend um, those as a, as a source. And also when you're talking about uh, property management and general contracting, yes, those, uh, those loans are available through those organizations. Indra Klein asks, are you aware of any business bartering services, whether B2B or B2C? Dr. Epps? Uh, no, no. Uh, I think that's it's more of a, a question is to ask the business owner. Whenever you're working with a business, it, you'll just be surprised um, to ask if, if those opportunities exist. Um, do you offer B2B? Do you offer B2C? Um, Anything is up for grabs right now. Everything's negotiable when it comes to, you know, being flexible as a business owner nowadays. So just ask the question, you know, send a quick email. Hey, I was on your site. I was interested in this. I'm also an owner. Would you, you know, consider doing a, a bartering service? The cheapest financing you can get is when your CFO or whoever handles that uses your vendors to increase the amount of time you get to pay with them. With that, we're going to end today's session. Thank the DC Retail Summit. Thank you for joining us for 2020, our recovery. Special thanks to my amazing panel, Lauren McDaniel of SeedSpot, Xavier Epps, XNE Financial Advising, Oswaldo Acosta, we call him the Wizard of Oz, 
President and Executive Director of City First Enterprises, and Michael Schumann, Director of Local Economy Programs at Neighborhood Associates Corporation. It's been a pleasure hosting today. We will survive, but we will do it together. Think local first.